Good morning, everyone. My name is Kapil Guy, and I'm the Senior Manager for Member and Partner Success here at the Toronto Region Board of Trade. Thank you for joining us this morning for our valued member CIBC's workshop on planning for retirement, achieve your goals with confidence. Today's enlightening workshop is designed to give you the tools and insights you need to make your retirement dreams a reality. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge this land on which we're meeting on is home to diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. Though you could be joining us or watching from anywhere, the board's offices are located on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. They share with us a sense of responsibility for intergenerational equity, the well-being of today and tomorrow. And now, without further ado, I'll pass over the mic to Eduardo Chasen, okay. who will be facilitating today's workshop. And for all the attendees that are here today, if you have any questions, please put your questions in the chat and we will be answering them at the end of today's workshop and while we do our Q&A. So without further ado, Eduardo, please take the stage and enlighten us all. <laughs> Thanks, Kapil. It's, it's great to be here. And I'd like to thank everybody for joining here today. It's, uh, it's I know your time is valuable and I hope to make the, the most of it for you here today. I'll give a little bit of a background around who I am and the team that I work with. Um, let's see if I can get the slides to move. Here we go. So my my name is, is Eduardo Chasin. I am a CFP professional. I am a personal financial planner. I'm a chartered investment manager. And over the past 16 years, I've been uh, building, implementing, and monitoring financial plans. That's been my bread and butter every day. And today, I work with a team that I've posted up on screen, and we not only build financial plans, but we provide investment advice and manage portfolios. Uh, Don Sohn on the right, he's been in the investment industry providing advice for over 20 years. And Vivian Chan, she is also a CFP professional. So you can see that the focus of our practice is in, in financial planning. And um, she is not only a CFP, she is also trading in options, stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. Um, with that being said, I'd like to discuss what we're going to be talking about, which is the agenda for today. There's always uh, something to follow. I'm going to start us off with a cash flow a cash flow budget so that you understand how to start to think about your um, expenses and how to use them more important. From there, I will take us through a case study that is, is founded on real life that we've been monitoring over many years. And it'll show you how to think about financial planning, which is one category of the financial industry, and another, which is the investing side, and how the two can work to help your retirement vision a reality. Um, at the end, I'll open up the lines for questions, but maybe if there's anybody that has any questions along the way and you feel comfortable using the chat box, please feel free to use it. Kapil will be monitoring that for us and uh, you'll be able to, to you know, post your question and I'll be happy to answer it at that time if I, I hope to see it. If not, I will answer it at the very end. Um, and if you are uncomfortable using the chat box, a piece of paper, pen, that is always very helpful for you. Just write it down and I'll be I'll be there to answer the question at the end. So with that being said, let's get into the first part, which is the preparation of a cash flow budget. It's, it sounds uh, interesting here. But when I when you think about a cash flow budget, the way that we approach this is the two-way method. And and you might be asking, well, why? Do we need to prepare a cash flow budget? It's it's really the foundation. Through this cash flow budget, you're able to identify really whether you have surplus at the end of the year or whether you don't have surplus. And what do I mean by surplus? Is it if there's excess cash, excess money in your bank account or checking account at the end of the year, or if not, and depending on the on whether yes or no, there's avenues that we can take. So let me show you how to start off in creating that budget for you. And the first thing that I want to do is show you my easiest method, which is the first one. And you have seen this across many locations, uh, websites, or even on your phone. But they are tools that are available to you to, 
just keep track of all your expenses. And it is important. Um, the benefit of that is that you're able to see exactly where all that money is going, whether it's to uh, pay down um, taxes on the property and to maintain the lights in the house, heating, fun, entertainment, all those categories start to shape up. And you can achieve that by either mixing your visa bills, your checking accounts, um, savings accounts. All of that will give you that number at the end of the day. But with all those variables, what we find is that we end up missing a lot of data points. Lots of variables are coming left and right. We'll miss them. And also, it can be very time consuming. So those are the pros and the cons. Now, we still recommend doing it, even if you get it for a month or two months, because you'll be able to see those variables start to take shape. And that's what we're really after with this method. It's not longevity. It's a little bit of work to get the details. Once you get through those details, I want you to introduce you another method of coming up with this, right? And this method is, is broad strokes. It catches everything. And I encourage everyone to use both methods, but I want to introduce you this one for the moment. And what you do is you look at your tax returns. I mean, the, the government knows how much money we're making in a year because they want to tax us. Right. So we're going to look at the income that comes in. We're going to subtract the taxes. Let's see if I can get my little pointer up. We'll subtract the taxes. We'll subtract the savings. If you have any debt payments and visas, mortgage payments, you subtract those numbers from your initial income number in your tax return. And that'll leave you with a big picture number. That's your, that'll be your lifestyle. That is actually telling you how much you're spending in a year. If you have a business or you have a portfolio that generates interest, dividends, or capital gains, the picture can get a little cloudy. So you may miss a few items here. That's why I recommend that if you do follow this method as well, you talk to a professional like an accountant, or you can probably do it yourself or financial planner like myself, will be able to look at that and dissect it for you and fine tune. So of course, this one has the pros, like I mentioned in the previous one, it's much more accurate. You're going to get to that number and it's going to be very, very, very exact. Um, but the problem with it is that you're using tax returns and they can get a little confusing. And the other problem is that you don't get the details. So you may end up finding, oh my God, I'm spending all this money, but where is it going? And that's why I encourage everybody to use the two methods because through the calculators, even though they may not live long in our hands, and I hope they do, but if they are short-lived, it still adds value in the sense that you're getting some of that pinpointing effect where you can see, oh, I'm spending too much here, or I could be spending more here, and then find out when you look at the big number, how it compares to the variables and really build that unique budget. So that takes you through the first level. And that could take a couple of, of months. It might, it might even take a year, but you will get to that point where you're like, oh my God, I know where my money is going. I know how I am spending it. And I am able to take charge of where my money is going. Now you're almost there ready to retire and you start thinking, well, I know what my budget is, right? I start to think, well, most people think in my early ages of retirement, I don't think that I'm going to be spending as much as at, at the, at the end and stage of my retirement. At the beginning, I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to be having fun. I'm energized and I want to use more of it at the beginning. And while that might be true, and I urge and encourage you to do that, don't assume that your budget is going to change. It's just one pocket will switch for the other. So while you're working, you may be commuting more or spending on extra clothes or eating out or taking clients out and different expenses. But in retirement, those expenses will be substituted by something else. And I want to encourage you to think about the following items in this next slide. When we ran a couple of surveys, 
we identified, and this has been a while, but 66% of parents end up supporting their grown up children. What do we mean? Well, you may have children. Those children may have children. You may want to support your grandkids. They may want to help with their mortgage payments. You may find yourself helping your grown-up children with helping them get started with either a new car or helping them get in any way, shape, or form that life takes us. And that's what tends to happen. The other statistic that we've been looking at is that 42% of young adults, and we're saying between the ages of 20 and 29, return home. So they've gone to school, they started a career, the career may have not taken off as expected, there have been issues in the employment industry, they're, they're not finding the jobs that are related to their career, and they are forced to come back home. And most parents will receive their kids back and help them out. The other thing that we're seeing, and this is a big one, is that 33% of Canadians are currently um, providing caregiving support to loved ones, or they expect to provide some form of support for them in the future. And that's, that's either their elderly parents, or it's a family member with a disability that needs to be taken care of or a special need that we have to account for. So back to the budget. Use the two methods, the calculators, which are websites or on your phone, use your tax returns, get to that big point number. And once you've identified, assume that you're not going to change your expenses now or in the future, especially into retirement. So um, that's the budget and that's the importance of the budget. So what do we do from here? What, what, what can we do? Once you identify your budget, there are different avenues that we can take. And that's where financial planning and investment planning come to play. And I have that case study that I was mentioning to you earlier. And it's, I'm gonna to introduce to you to the two couple, it's, a, it's based on a real case. And they are, I've changed their names of course, but they're, we're gonna call them Colt and Jody. They're age 53. When we started off in their initial meeting, we discovered that Colt and Jody um, were generating an employment income, a combined household income of $300,000. That was new to them. They were excited about it. We estimated their, um, their income at that point. They mentioned to us that they want to retire. When they saw themselves retiring, at age 65, that's about 12 years from when we met at that time. They also told us that their after-tax lifestyle was closing into the $120,000. That's, that's as a household unit that they were spending after taxes. And we came to that number using the two-step method that I showed you in the previous slides, using the calculator and the tax returns. And we identified that 120. And they also told us, because this is really what drove them to, to talk to us, is that, hey, um, we have a $500,000 mortgage. We're paying 4.5% rate on this one. Our annual payments, and I've rounded them up, are about $45,000 a year. And with this new income, what should we do? We hear all these things happening. Interest rates are changing. The housing corrects. All, all sorts. Should we pay our mortgage down? So what we did is say, well, what, what, how much do we have at this point to, to work with? We know you have uh, $300,000 of income. We know you have a lifestyle. We estimated how much you're paying. What's the remainder of the cash flow that we can use to either pay down the mortgage or not? So we did the surplus analysis. And it looks something like this. We started off, like I just mentioned, $300,000. We knew how much taxes we were, they were going to pay on average based on their income. We looked at their tax returns to determine that number. We knew that they were paying about $45,000 in mortgage payments a year. We estimated, hey, we're not going to put the savings at this point into your RSPs. We just don't know what we have to work with, if we have anything to work with. 
you told us you have $120,000 in lifestyle needs based on the variable calculator and the tax return. And that tells us that whatever you're not making in payments to the tax world, whatever you're not making in payments to the mortgage, and whatever you're not spending on, on yourself to keep the house going and your, your lifestyle needs is surplus. That's what we can use to direct and put it in any place that we see is the best for you. So, of course, when uh, Colton Jody, let me see if we can get this up. Colton Jody saw that 40000 at the bottom of the list. They say, oh, well, we can either put it into the mortgage and accelerate that mortgage, which is what drove them to the meeting and say, I want to pay down my mortgage. But they said, well, maybe we can also put it into the savings and see what that would do for us in the end. It's a logical question, right? Do we pay down the debt or do we save or do we find a combination of? So we started off with the first analysis and this is a single analysis. This is what they came for, the mortgage. We said, hey, your current mortgage payment schedule looks something like this. You're currently paying 45,000. We just saw that at 4.5. What that means is that you'll be debt free your mortgage will be paid off by the time you're age 68. Visually, it looks like this in this graph. You start off with 500,000. At the very bottom, you see the ages of Colton Jody. And you see that in the pre-retirement years, that debt is gradually going down, 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 down. They hit their retirement. The debt is still there two years into their retirement and they're debt free at 68. Colton Jody saw that and said, well, okay, we've managed to pay down that mortgage down, but I sure feel that it's much better to pay down that mortgage. And he did the exact same thing. He said, well, Colton Jody, if you take the $40,000 that we just saw on the other side and we put those 40,000 to your mortgage, you're going to be mortgage-free at age 59. And I don't know if we can raise hands here, but I can tell you that most of us see $500,000 in debt starting off and then disappearing. By the time you're 59, I see that I'm debt-free at pre-retirement. I mean, that feels great. Sign me up, All right? That 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 is That is most of our feelings. That is what most of us would go after. And then when we're looking at it on a single variable uh, picture, which is debt, it makes absolute sense. If we look at them side by side, it's even much more of a shocking picture because you can see at the top, the current mortgage payments. And at the bottom, you see the accelerated payments. And you can see my red line crossing right down the middle in retirement. And my God, it feels great to be debt free at 59. So when you look at that, you'd say, okay, this, this is the decision we have to make. And this is where I want to introduce you all to the value that financial planning can have for you. Because when you look at that, we would all make the decision to pay the debt right away. And I'm sure you would all think right now that that's the idea. And me included, if I look at it, that's it. But we're taking it a step further. We're going to say, what happens if we look at it in your big picture from a cash flow point of view? We're going to do a cash flow analysis that is something that we do in financial planning. It's a little bit more in depth because we're looking at all sources of income. We're going to start them off by looking at the same variables in the accelerated method where they pay the mortgage quickly. Hey, Colton Jody, if you follow this method, you'll be debt free at age 59. But what does that mean from a cash flow point of view? It means that because you're directing all your money to your mortgage, your savings will be limited and you won't be able to save until after your 59th birthday. What does that mean? Well, you're investing 85,000 into your mortgage, which is the 45 plus the 40 surplus that you have. But after your 59th, that same $85,000 will only go into savings for the last five years of your working career. So you see how the cash flow is a little bit different. 
than the initial analysis of do we pay down the debt or not. It's we're still doing the same analysis, but we're looking at it from every angle, from a cash flow point of view and from a savings point of view. And this is coming from our, our proprietary financial planning software, which we use at Wood Gundy for our clients. And what we do is we look at the income and we're looking on the left-hand side of the graph. That is their employment income. We said that they were starting off at 300,000 within their um, working years, right? And at the very top, we have a total needs line that is indicating to us that they are using their entire income to maintain their lifestyle, to pay their debt and pay their taxes. All of it is being met. No dollar is missing at this point. And it, it grows up gradually. You might see that little step up because we're keeping it with inflation. So everything is being adjusted along the way. And as we mentioned, by the time they reach their 59th birthday, we start to see a little gap here to take shape because they paid off their debt. They're debt free, which means now let's buckle in. Let's go into the savings category. We filled up one category, which we're debt free. Now we paid our debt. We paid the mortgage. We're now into the second category. We're moving into savings. And this is where we see the graph take a drastic change. We end up with another line here at the very bottom, which is a gray one, which is indicating their total needs distant from what they are saving. And you can see, let me clear that out a little so that it becomes a little bit better to see. These gaps that start to appear here are the $85,000 that are going into their RSPs. Along the way, because when we're contributing to RSPs, we do receive some tax credits. We're compounding now the government's refund into their RSPs and making that retirement a lot better. So it's still looking great. We have the five final years of retirement where we're saving and we pay down the mortgage here at the beginning. So savings at the end and mortgage at the beginning. And what does that look like in the big picture of retirement? And that's why we're here. How does that fit in with my retirement? We know it feels great to pay the debt down in at age 59, but how does it look like when I retire? And that's the second stage of this graph. And you can see now, the, the last year we're starting in the first, let me start off with the first column that appeared at age 65. They're retired at that point. There's no more employment income. That's why all the blue bars that were at the beginning are gone. There's no more employment income. We have to substitute that with something. And we're receiving now CPP at the very bottom, represented by the gold. And we start to take money out of our registered retirement savings accounts, which is represented by the purple. And we were great that we made the last contribution to the RSP on the previous year. So we got our final tax credit. And this is great. It still feels good. We made our contributions. We, we made our mortgage payments. We retired. And if nothing, if we don't look at anything else but these variables, we could see that the registered accounts would last until the age of 71. And at that point, based on what we looked at within these few variables, we observed that there appeared these red bars, which are the shortfalls. What did this tell us? Well, it told us that if Colt and Jody accelerate their mortgage payments, pay down their mortgage first, and then start to save, they would have sufficient RSP accounts that would carry them through retirement until the age of 72, based on their current spending pattern. And that was you know, very valuable information at that point in time. It still felt good. But before we moved on, you know that we did the analysis on what happens if we just keep down paying the same way that we've been doing so far. It may be the correct way or the combination. So we did the scenario too, of course. Said, well, Colton, Jody, what happens if we don't accelerate your mortgage payments? What happens if we just keep the course 
maintain that mortgage payment. And in the same time, start saving today. And that's what we did. Say, hey, continue the mortgage payments. Be mortgage-free at 65, 68 into retirement. That feels painful already. But let's see what happens. And let's save a combination of money into your RSPs and see what happens. But we're not going to do it just for five years. In this case, we're saving for 12 consecutive years. The impact behind this is seen again in the cash flows. As you can see, this cash flow graph looks a little bit different, and I'll compare the other one with this one in a minute, but I want to explain it again. You see the $300,000 shows up again. But in this case, there's a little bit of a difference between the gray line and the black line. Black line and the gray line indicate that, hey, at this point, we have savings going on into the RSPs. And in the first year, we don't get any tax credits for our first RSP contribution, but we get the refund coming in the next year. And we get that again. And we get refunds not only for five years, we get refunds for almost 12 years. And we compound that in the growth. So you can see this is starting to balloon up. When we looked at the retirement, we found out that not only were we able to build an RSP, we were able to build a TFSA as well. And the TFSA and the RSPs expanded into retirement. And the gap that we saw before was now eliminated. Let me show you side by side. On the top graph, we have the accelerated payment. And in the bottom side, we have their current payment. At the beginning, you see there's a difference because we are not saving into the RSPs. In the bottom one, we have continuous RSP savings. When we compare the retirement cash flow, which is what we're after, what we wanted to see, you see that there is two years that are missing in the accelerated payment and two years that are filled with the current mortgage payment. And that difference is about $230,000 worth of retirement cash flows. That's a lot of money at the end of the day. And Colton Jody would not have seen that if they had only done the analysis on the debt because they were only looking at one variable and they were not looking at the cash flow analysis. That's the value here. It's important to look at all variables, not just one variable. And that's where financial planning comes to. So the key takeaways are you can't get to this stage unless you run that cash flow budget for yourselves. It's important to build it. It's the starting point. Once you identify that, you are able then to start taking the next steps and analyzing absolutely everything. Income, credits, taxes, CPP, RIF payments. All of that flows together into a comprehensive cash flow analysis. But at this point, Colton Jody only gave us one variable to analyze, which was the mortgage payment. And they ultimately decided, okay, let's follow the path of saving into the RSPs over a long haul and monitor. And, and to be fair, people think, oh, well, what happens if the interest rates on the mortgages change and they go up higher? What happens is that on the same side, the investments into the RSPs also adjust to the interest rate environment. You may have seen GICs dropping over the last couple of months. You may have also seen the GICs rising up while the interest rates were rising. So in this effect, they both go hand in hand and the differentials that we just saw are, will always be the same or close to those numbers that I just showed. Um, at this point, uh, I don't assume there's no questions because I haven't seen anything, Kapil, but I'm going to move into the investment side, which is the second stage of the case study. Because Colt and Jody, all they've done is figured out where to direct the money. And that's what financial plan does for you. It helps you find how much money you have, build a picture and say, where do I direct that money? 
And then you go into the next stage, which is, okay, I know whether I have to invest. How do I invest? And I always start, and, and our team starts by explaining the, the noise of investments. What do I mean by that? And then we're saying reduce the influence of noise. When we say noise, I'm talking about stuff like what we're experiencing exactly today, political instability. We're talking about things like interest rates and anything that appears on the news that is making people run left, making people run right, and, and, and pretty much spooking everybody into reacting emotionally to what's happening out there. We've been hearing, should we target the portfolio to invest for a Trump win, or should we do a portfolio for a Harris win? What happens if there's more war? All of these things are always in people's minds. But making decisions on the noise that's happening or what's called the flavor of the day is not going to be in your best interest. We have to be aware of it. I'm not saying ignore it, but we just have to be aware. But it shouldn't influence our decisions. And the question then is, okay, great. I know that all that's happening. How, how do I eliminate this noise? The, if you've read on any... Um, Warren Buffett, he is the king of saying to invest for the long term. And But long-term investment isn't just what it is. But let's give the benefit of it. Because it does help us eliminate all that noise that I just showed back there. What do I mean? Well, if you look at $1,000 and you invested that $1,000 60 years ago, you, you went into a room, put the $1,000 invested it in cash, turned away and never looked back, came back 60 years later, you would have seen the $1,000. Even if you had left it in cash, it would have turned into $33,000. It would have gone through um, uh, tech bubbles, through oil embargoes. It would have gone through uh, financial collapses. It would have gone through political changes, war. It would have gone through a lot of things in those 60 years. And the $1,000 would have still turned into $33,000 if you had left it in cash. You may have gone into the bond world and said, well, I'm going to take the 77. If you had invested only in Canadian dollar uh, equities and, again, not turned your back on it until 60 years later, you would have had half a million dollars. And if you were fortunate enough to invest in a global economy, including the United States, for those 60 years and ignored it, you would have had $1.4 million. And that's the power of long-term investing. That's pretty much what they're saying, you know, invest it and forget it. But the vast majority of us, well, we don't have the luxury to say, hey, I'm gonna invest my money and disappear and ignore it for 60 years. That, that would not happen. Because we need that money to live on, especially if we're going to be retired. And to, to bring the point home, this is if, if we do nothing, if we just sit on it. And these variables that we're looking in this screen is the S&P and TSX Composite. So that's Canada. This is the United States, the S&P 500. And this would be the MSCI World Index. These are charts that track the growth of, in this case, $10,000 through this period of time at the very bottom, since 1990 till 2019. And if you had just sat in these indexes, you would have had from 10,000, you would have been at almost 180,000 if you were in the S&P 500 by 2019. But we can't, like I said, just sit on it and forget about it. Well, because imagine if you had retired in the worst time would have been in the year 2000 if you had retired there. And you had immediately started using your money, thinking everything's good. 9-11 comes in. The markets keep on tanking. You have tech bubbles in those years as well. And then you've still spent your money. So if you've actually gone below those indexes, you may have gone back up. But by the time 2009, 2008 came along, things started to look better. And all of a sudden, everything collapses again. So you would have spent almost, if I erase all this, 
ink that I just put in between here and almost 2012. If you had retired in that year, you would have spent almost your entire retirement trying to catch up and actually seeing your portfolios going down. It would have been a very scary situation for this couple if they had decided to just sit and invest in an index and say, well, I'm diversified. But they are not truly diversified. They are only following an, an index. And yes, they eliminated the noise because if they had waited long enough, everything would have been fine, but they spent half of their retirement in a bad situation. So we still want to invest for the long term. I'm not saying don't. We still want to do that, but it shouldn't be the only thing we do. It helps us eliminate the noise. It helps us know that we're going to come out of it, but we need to diversify. It needs to be more diversified than just an, an index or a few equities that we choose. We need to diversify. And the true meaning of diversification is represented by the screen that I am showing you here. I, I was froze. What we're looking at in this chart, and I know it looks like a lot of numbers and colors, so let me explain it to you so you can see what it is. This is called a quilted chart, and it shows 12 different asset classes and portfolios that are diversified in themselves, and how those asset classes, those 12 from top to bottom, and how those asset classes move through time across the top. And I have this going for 10 more years, up until 2019. And what this is showing us is the importance of being truly diversified and not just following an index or an ETF or the flavor of the day. For example, if you had been invested in the Canadian equities in the year 2010, when 2011 was finished, we would have seen our 17% return almost gone. Because if you look all, I'm going to try and make this visual, but I'm going to squiggle all the line all the way down, almost all the way down to the bottom. You're going to see the Canadian equities show up again. And they lost that year 8.7. We lost a good portion in that year of what we made. So imagine if you had been only in a Canadian, you would have not been happy. But the diversification comes where you may have invested also in global bonds. And when you invested in those global bonds, although nobody may have wanted to touch them in the year 2010, guess what happened? They went from the very bottom all the way to the top and they brought 8.3% to our portfolios. That is true meaning of diversification. Because yes, even though the markets would have been down and you would have listened in, on every news anchor's mouth come and say, oh, the end of the world is here. The balanced portfolio, your investment portfolio, your retirement money, your cash flows, your day-to-day -day activities are protected because you are really diversified. And this diversification, not only of 50 stocks, 500 stocks, it's asset class diversification and true portfolio diversification gives you what I've called here a smoother ride. And you can see it going through many years. The so global bonds, then the next year they went down, but Canadian equity went back up. And if you had invested in international equities, you would have been very, very happy, but you would have been very, very sad the previous year. So it's about helping you, see, eliminate all that noise and smooth out your final ride. We explained this to Colt and Jody. We're going to come back to how we implemented this for them. But before that, we also have to consider the taxation on investments. Many people forget that when we generate income, we have to pay taxes. And it's not just from employment. Our portfolios pay taxes. And I'm going to give you two examples. The first one, is around the non-registered investments. These non-registered investments are accounts that generate interest, dividends, and capital gains. And depending on how you allocate those investments, you'll either pay more taxes or less taxes. Again, it has to follow within your risk profile, and you do not want to be making decisions to avoid taxation because that will create other problems on their own. 
But so you can understand what I'm talking about. When we look at these two pie charts here, we're looking at a portfolio that is taxed at the highest tax level. Why? Because it's heavily invested in bonds and cash, mostly in bonds. 75% to be exact is invested in bonds. When bonds generate income, they generate interest income, and that interest income will be taxed at the highest level. So let me give you an example. If you're working and you have a portfolio that is generating interest income for you, your employment income is taxed at, let's say, 50%. And then on top of that, we're going to throw more interest income that's going to also be taxed at 50%. Your, your growth, your portfolio is pretty much being eliminated by taxation. And on top of that, I haven't included that one, but inflation will also eat up into it. So you may be investing in field A, it's growing, but it's really after taxes. If you're working, it's disappearing on you. So you may want to consider the alternative especially while you're working and changing. It has to follow many profiles, but I want you to understand the, the decision-making process that goes behind this. It's not just investing and getting a return. It's how are we getting that return? Because if you look at the other side of that same equation, if you invested in a stock portfolio that generates dividends, it's more on the other pie chart, where this one is 80% on stocks and dividends, it'll be taxed at the lowest tax bracket. And you can change these as you go in time. And I'm going to show you how we did that for Colt and Jody. But they looked at 80% lower taxation if you invest. And I'm going to bring this home a little bit further by showing you a comparison between two portfolios. Um, the, the account balances and how they impact it. We started off in this one. We're looking at a bond-focused only portfolio. The highest concentration, that's the one that will be taxed at the highest level. I assume that we start off with a million dollars and we're maintaining a lifestyle that I know is going to be taxed at the highest level for demonstration purposes so that you can see how long this will last and the impact that taxation has on your decisions. And you can see the million dollars being depleted over time and we see it disappearing by the time that in this scenario, that portfolio would have been gone by the age of 82 and 83. That's the result of a 5% return, it's a 5% return with a million dollar portfolio being depleted to maintain a $120,000 lifestyle. I did the exact same thing. I said, hey, give me another million dollars. I'm gonna put it to generate 5% and we're gonna maintain that same $120,000 lifestyle. So a million dollars, 5% to maintain the exact lifestyle. And you can see we go a little bit further because we're not getting taxed as much. We're not paying as much taxes. So in this, we focused in Canadian dividend equity because we'd get some tax credits. It's less tax. It's more favorable for you from a cash flow point of view. And the difference, when you compare them side by side, is a $200,000 difference in this scenario. We don't know what it would look like for a person from person, but we have to do that analysis to see, hey, do we need to make adjustments? Can we improve the person's cash flow? Can we improve their lifestyle? Can you do that for yourself? And this is the power of knowing the impact of taxation on your non-registered portfolios if you are while you're working years and how it impacts also in retirement. So you have to look at it and it's going to be a thing that changes. If you have a business and you have assets being invested in the corporation, these things get a little bit more complicated and they have to be analyzed as well. But I wanted to make sure that everybody knew that taxation is something to consider also when investing. It's not just the return. It's not just I want a 5% of return. It's how is that 5% going to be taxed today and in the future? And you can see that in this case, it's, it's significant. Not only does it impact those non-registered accounts, I'm going to give you this last example. And then I'll go into back into the case study so you can see again how it flows together. The taxation is different per account. I am going to show you a, a very dramatic case here so you can see it. 
but I'm comparing in this chart that same million dollar non-registered dividend portfolio that we saw a minute ago generated at 5%. It's targeting a different lifestyle, but it's the same million dollars at 5%, as you can see at the very bottom, a million dollars at 5%, million dollars. They both start at the same rate. But at the bottom, we're looking at an R, a RIF, which would be the same as your RRSP or your Registered Retirement Savings Plan. If you start withdrawing at the same exact rate, the registered account would disappear right here on the 79th birthday. 10 years worth of difference right there. Right? Almost 10 years. It's a lot of, it's, it's, it's a huge, huge discrepancy right there. And that's the power of taxation. Because when the money comes out of your RSPs or your RIF accounts, we have to pay taxes on that as if we were receiving actual employment income. Whereas when we're receiving dividends, we're receiving tax credits. Yes, there's a little bit more risk in it, and it's not fair to compare them apples to apples, but you can see I wanted to show you the impact that taxation has on the decisions we make today and how we withdraw that money. And knowing that, we're able to help uh, Colt and Jody make the final decisions. So to recap what we do with investments, okay, number one, and this should be applied to everybody, is try to eliminate or not eliminate. Be aware of it, but reduce the noise. It's going to be there all the time. Today in particular, it's it's everywhere. But reduce it, knowing that you're invested for the long term. And also say, okay, I know I'm in the long term to benefit from the growth. And that this too shall pass. But what we're looking for is the diversification that will allow me to reduce those years of highs and lows because when one goes up, the other one will go down. And it gives you that cash flow requirement throughout your entire life. That's the diversification. And important, consider the taxation. If you're going to invest 5%, make sure that after the government has seen that income appear at 5%, you get as much of that 5% back and you don't end up paying a lot of taxes, unnecessary taxes, because you'll lose it. The final thing I'm going to give you today is how we implemented all of this information in Colton Jody's plan. When Colton Jody understood the investments, how they were approaching it, when they were looking at their taxes, when they were looking at the direction that financial planning gave them, they gave all the information that they had. And I've rounded everything. So they started off, well, we have the $600,000 in a non-registered portfolio. We have TFSAs and we have our RSPs that are currently being growing, that are growing and then we're investing into. How can we optimize this? The first thing that we did, we looked at the non-registered account. And we know that Colt and Jody are 53. Their income is $300,000. How many of you want to pay more taxes by the income that this non-registered account is generating. I know I, I don't want to pay more taxes. I want to reduce them. So we changed the strategic allocation of the non-registered to something that was more oriented towards the dividends to reduce the tax burden while they are working. That also gave them the opportunity to increase their lifestyle because we're getting dividends. And I'll get to that in a minute. With the income that was generated there, we sheltered it into the TFSAs, and we also sheltered it into the RIF accounts. Every year, it was an automatic, organic transfer from one money, from one pocket to the other. Now we had their portfolios working for them, building more wealth, getting tax benefits from the government, and growing. And we prepared a diversified portfolio that included those fixed income that I showed you that nobody wanted to touch that were at the bottom and then they started coming up. That was a component. We invested for the long term. They had 
about 10 years, 12 years, where they can tolerate some of that volatility and achieve higher growth. And in the meantime, we had to rebalance. Every three or certain years, we would take some of the equity and redeploy that into the fixed income to keep the balance that we see in these charts well balanced. Otherwise, the blue sector and the green sector start to eat up into this one and you end up with an unbalanced portfolio. So that's something that you always have to be doing and monitor. And ultimately what we did is, and once we did that, now the debt, whether we pay the debt at 59 or 68, that kind of took a second plane, but it was still an important concept and we took it back to the cash flows. We invested those portfolios, we reduced the taxation, and we now have a taxable non-registered account that is still there. It was always there, but it's now generating dividends for them. And we can see that now if I'm going to try and make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, I'm going to erase that so you can actually see the impact. You can see the non-registered portfolio. I lost the zoom, but I'm going to go and bring it back you can see that now we have their non-registered portfolios also working for them today. They have income being generated that has not only improved their income from 300,000, but all to up to $350,000. And their tax situation actually improved. We started to receive tax credits from, from the government whenever we started to make the RSP contributions. That's in the little purple here. And we were still making their mortgage payments gradually for the last 12 years until retirement. At that point, they still had a little bit of debt, but it was almost gone. And when they retired, they were no longer receiving their employment income. The employment income, which was the first blue bars, are gone. They're gone in the final year at retirement. Let me erase all these lines so you can actually see it. Because we're now in retirement. The taxable savings that were initially building up with dividends, now we switched them up to interest. And we're in this age right now with them. The taxable in uh, savings, which were at the beginning of the graph, they were focused towards dividends. We switched those now to interest because they were going to maintain their lifestyle in a time when their taxes were much lower. And you can see that because the graph all of a sudden takes this huge dive. That's the, they're not paying taxes much there that year because the only interest that is being, the only income that is being generated is CPP at the very bottom and interest from their taxable accounts. And that we used, we depleted it over a one, two, three year period. By that third year, remember we were building TFSA accounts as well? We now started to use their tax-free savings accounts. And the TFSAs started to flow into their retirement cash flows. Again, keeping those taxes ultra low and improving their lifestyle. Because I haven't gotten to that, but we actually improved their cash flows. And after their 71st birthday, that's when we actually started to use their registered accounts. We delayed taxation as long as possible. And by doing that, if you look at the graph, and I'm gonna erase all this ink, and I'll explain what I'm looking at. And I'm sorry, if it's, it's a lot of detail, but I'm, uh, I think it's valuable for you. Sorry, I don't want that. Well, Capel, I think I've, yeah, I don't have the ability to erase all this stuff. So. Yeah. Eduardo, in the uh, yeah. interest of time, do you think we should head on to the Q and A? Yeah, I lost track. Yeah, so I, no, actually, this no is the problem. end. So let me just move it into the final bit of what we did and open up the lines of questions because this is what we ended up doing. We prepared the cash flow for them. We decided to pay down the mortgage. We made the RSPs and TFSA contributions. They diversified, like we said, and ultimately we optimized their portfolios for efficiency in taxes. Um, 
I'll open up the lines now, Kapila, if that's it. I'll post my contact information in case anybody has to leave. They can write our names down and emails and phone numbers. And if they can't stay, I'll be happy to answer those questions at a later time. Yeah, Thanks. no problem. So, um, Eduardo, we have uh, we have time for two questions. Um, does anything change in this case study if they, Colt and Jody, are business owners? Yeah, that's a great question. So, absolutely it would change. We would have a little bit more of a complicated scenario where we would have to identify what is being generated inside the corporation, the type of corporation they have, whether it's a CCPC, a private corporation. Um, and then that would um, help us determine the blend of budget that they have, whether they're spending in the personal or the corporate side. And then we would also figure out whether we have to take dividends from the corporation to pay themselves or should we use their personal assets to maintain their lifestyle? Also, selling the property and the assets that are held in the corporation, that makes a lot of uh, more of a interesting <laughs> plan. Um, you know, it takes a little bit more effort and more complicated, but in the end, we do the same. The same analysis applies to them. Thank you. Gabriel. Awesome. Uh, and the last question that we have enough time for today Um do you have data that includes up to 2013, sorry, 2023 and 2024 post COVID? You know, I, that's, that's a good one. We have it. And I'm happy they caught that because we do have these graphs, which are as of 2020, 19. And you could have imagined that in this one in particular, you would see these graphs taking a big dive at this point in time. I don't have it in this one. As, as you can see, I started this as in 2019. We will be updating these for the next uh, presentations. Um, but yeah, that's a great point. We did see these graphs with the pandemic drop, but immediately we've seen these things in the past year, we've seen 25 plus returns on some of these indices. So, you know, yeah, I, I, that's a good point. I don't have it at this point. We will get it to them. And if they're, we want to discuss with us, I'm happy to show us our raw data is where this is coming from. Perfect. So, um, Eduardo, that would conclude, uh, today's, uh, today's session. I know that, um, Eduardo, if the attendees would like to get in touch with you, um, yeah. will you be reaching out with some information post, uh, post webinar? You know, yeah, I think that's a good idea. If, if everybody's okay with it, I'll send them the, the PowerPoint presentation Perfect. that they'll be able to, you know, review. And if they have further questions, I'm always happy to answer them. I really enjoy the, the queries and, and get to meet people and understand their unique circumstances. So. Thank you for that. Yes. Thank you, Eduardo, for uh, sharing this amazing information with us today. Um, and thank you to all the attendees for attending. And we hope to see you next time at more of our uh, member workshops. Thank you for attending today. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you 